Hello, thanks for joining us. Tonight, a special investigation into Australia's worst peacetime disaster and the survivor who undergoes hypnosis to unlock the secrets of that terrible night. Full speed ahead. What was it? Full speed ahead. And what's happened? It's black. What are you doing? I'm trying to breathe underwater. Yeah, what are you doing? I can't get in the air. What's happening? I'm trying to find a way to get out. <laughs> Tonight marks the 28th anniversary of the Voyager disaster, the Navy destroyer that was sunk by the aircraft carrier Melbourne during manoeuvres off the coast of New South Wales. 82 men lost their lives in a tragic incident that remains embroiled in controversy even today. Most of the survivors are still fighting to be compensated for the psychological injuries they suffered. Some, like the men you're about to meet, have never recovered from the trauma. Peter Wilkinson reports. One went to sea with pride for your country. You took pride in your ship. And when I see it these days, it's enough to make you cry. I've been picked up in the street a couple of times in the week, put through hospital and they just thought, oh, well, he's got a, a problem, and they sent me away and certified me. I guess they probably would have preferred us to have gone like the ship, out of sight. 82 seamen died on Voyager. The reason the survivors still suffer is because, through their eyes, the Australian Navy's integrity also died with those 82 men. The Voyager survivors almost seem to have been the forgotten men in all of this. I think there was a view that they were this great embarrassment to the Navy. Tom Frame, a naval lieutenant who's written a book that leaves no doubt in the reader's mind that it was a dreadful malaise within the Navy that led to the Voyager tragedy. And the Navy is responsible for the suffering that continues. Well, I think the Navy for a long time had been in decline and when the Navy's in decline there's a possibility that professional sta standards uh, will decline as well. Of the two ships, most of us remember the aircraft carrier. Melbourne was the Navy's jinxed ship. Planes had problems landing on her. And besides the Voyager catastrophe, there was an American destroyer sliced in two in 1969. Her name, the Frank E. Evans, and 74 Americans died. I named this ship Voyager. Voyager was, by all reports, a happy ship until that fateful trip 28 years ago. She had just been inadequately refitted in Victoria. There is no question that Voyager was not ready for the exercise in which she was involved when the collision occurred. The refit was shortened. It wasn't a very effective refit. There were many, many problems. It's just that you get a, a quick flash there, you know, just for a minute or so, you'll, you'll think about it and think about a particular person, you know, what would they be like today? Buzzy Luttrell was a teenage radio operator on Voyager. That night, he was off duty. I'd just gone to bed and I heard this singing sort of half sat up and I remember me either knocking my glasses or just hitting the, the bulkhead. And the next slice I sort of remember is um, I was fell down a deck or something and then was blown out through an ammunition hole when the boilers blew. It really is hard to imagine what it would have been like. There would have been a point in time when the sailors watching realised Melbourne towering overhead was going to hit. And then a tearing collision, 20,000 tonnes travelling at 22 knots, Melbourne sliced straight through Voyager, like a hot knife through butter. The Navy has announced that the destroyer had 324 men on board when she went down after her nighttime collision with the carrier. Were you alone in the bunk room? No, no, our mess deck was nearly full. We would have had about 
I think it held about 32 and there's about 24 in there. And how many got out? Four of us got out of that. Buzzy then found himself in the oily water. We formed a circle of about 15. Why did you form a circle? You could treat water by hanging on. So it was just a, a ways of keeping um, afloat. And of those 15 in that circle, how many survived? Only a couple of us, because it was just too long. So they used one of the boats. It was tradition, and they had to find the captain first in one of the cutters until they found his body. They weren't allowed to pick up a, another person. A lot of blokes drowned waiting just while they were trying to find the captain. Uh, not as often as I'd 28 like. years after the accident, to find Buzz Luttrell, you have to travel to one of the most isolated parts of Australia, Bruny Island, southeast of Tasmania. He lives alone, brain damaged and crippled through alcohol. I don't go out. Uh, I've been in probably little picture show for over 30 years. I've never been to the theatre. Why not? Well, it didn't fit in with my lifestyle at the time. I was just, everything was revolved around booze. I was just going to the pub and just sitting by myself. Just 17 months after the tragedy, he was diagnosed by the Navy as a chronic alcoholic. Oh, when I first got it, it was um, beer and top shelf. And then when I couldn't get beer and that, I started hitting the, the cleaning fluids and that. Well, they used to have a lot of boot polish and caro mixed together, you know, the brass, though. You got some psychiatric counselling, didn't you, fairly quickly after the accident? We got nothing. We didn't even get to see um, anything. My first account, I'd already been discharged, and I don't know how long after I'd been discharged before I was put up, and, well, then it was an asylum, and even in the hospital then, it was nothing. It wasn't even brought up. We just considered throwaways. Gary Evans, too, was another teenager on Voyager. I can remember the oil. I didn't realise it was oil at the time. But it was a case of trying to keep the head out of the water. Um, if you got any in the mouth, you were trying to vomit. It just made that task of staying alive that much more difficult. When rescuers picked Gary Evans out of the water, he had a fractured skull and multiple injuries. I have trouble with neck and shoulders. The hands are not what they used to be. That's just part of the uh, um, ongoing problems that I've had as a result of uh, injuries received. Today, uh, anyone's injured, they're, they're, uh, they're covered for the rest of their life. But uh, people of Voyager time, they weren't. They were, they're just discarded. That hurts. And here we have the wheelhouse on the left. If it's hard to imagine why the trauma remains so real, maybe it helps to go on board a destroyer with a man who experienced the accident. But you see, now just thinking about it, I'm getting goosebumps. Alex Haggerty's station was in the ship's wheelhouse operating the port telegraph to the engine room. The order came full speed ahead and if I remember it correctly I put on full speed ahead and then there was a bang, the lights went out, the place filled up with water. Remembering for Alex Haggerty is like peering through thick smoke. He simply can't put all the pieces together. There was metal uh, metal pieces sticking out and I cut my hands and the back of my legs on it and I got out through this hole and I was looking up at a hatchway above me. After the accident, Haggerty became a misfit. A familiar story. Drinking and psychiatric problems. I had snakes and creepy crawlers all over me and I tore my clothes off and I was brushing these imaginary things off my body. There was one part of my mind saying, it's not happening, you're imagining it. But the other part was screaming and I was horrified. How many times have you been in a psychiatric clinic? 
Um, seven or eight times. Had you had any particular troubles before the accident? No, none at all. I, I had a very high intelligence quote, quotient. I still have it. Although I've lost about 20 points now through the drinking in the last, last years. Alex Haggerty needs to see people and to be with people who can help him. And it disappoints me, I suppose, that this long after the collision, he is still suffering, and yet he seems not to be able to find a way to, to overcome those sufferings and, and to lead a normal life. So is the Navy still responsible? I believe the Navy has a continuing responsibility for everyone who has ever served this country in the Defence Force. Naval historian Lieutenant Tom Frame, whose investigation of the tragedy, a book entitled Where Fate Calls, was released today. After the break, Peter Wilkinson's report continues when survivor Alex Haggerty undergoes hypnosis to discover the truth about the tragedy. I'm drowning. What are you doing? I can't get in the air. What's happening? I'm trying to find a way to get out. <laughs> The night of February 10, 1964, marked a tragic turning point in the life of Alex Haggerty. The trauma of the collision, coupled with his subsequent questioning by senior Navy men, affected him deeply. He began to doubt that he'd followed orders correctly and even felt he could be to blame for the sinking of Voyager. Finally, Alex sought help to try to unblock his memory of the disaster. What do you remember of the minutes before the collision? Personally, nothing. I'm talking to you about it. You know and I know that I went through it. But here I can't believe I went through it because this barrier is closed and won't let it come out. We're going to give you an injection to help you relax. Mm -hmm. What Alex Haggerty wants more than anything on earth is to get better. That feels comfortable. <coughs> he wants Your to be hypnotized, yes. to be taken back 28 years to that terrible night, it's the to confront the demons the in his brain. And let your mind go to just before the collision. A ship being split in half, uh, many men dying, the severity of the trauma coupled with the negative thoughts that were given to him by senior people, really caused self-doubt and, and ruminations. He developed a, an obsession and a compulsion to drink alcohol, and I think that that's just in, indicative of the original trauma. Sydney doctor, Alan Fay. Let's hear how they said it. Full speed ahead. What was it? Full speed ahead. And what's happening? And then all of a sudden... What is it? The lights went out. What's happening? The lights went out. And then it filled up with water. What's happening now? We filled up with water. The whole wheelhouse filled up with water. So it's black? It's black. What are you doing? I'm trying to breathe underwater. You're underwater? I'm underwater. How do you feel? I'm drowning. What are you doing? I can't get in the air. What's happening? These thoughts, they, they rush through my mind. Or maybe it was your fault that the Voyager went down. Maybe you turned the telegraph the wrong way. So people have told you that, that you were lying? People who weren't there... Right. ...have told me... And this is influencing you? It is influencing How me, is it influencing yes. you? What's it making you think or feel? It makes me feel like a... ...like a liar. Which I wasn't. I told the truth an hour and a half after the collision. <coughs> Alex was a happy-go-lucky person before the trauma and uh, unfortunately the way he was questioned by senior people after the trauma put doubts into his mind and thoughts so he was virtually hypnotised at the age of 17 and his life um, went off the rails so to speak. How do you feel? I feel good. I've just, just... You followed orders? I followed my orders. How, did, how, how are the other two men in the wheelhouse? They also followed their orders. OK, what's happening now? I asked Alex to view the it? film for the experience that he'd been through with supportive uh, people, preferably his therapist, but also with his wife, so that he would be able to really understand what happened those many years ago. 
I'm drowning. What are you doing? I can't get in the air. What's happening? I'm trying to find a way to get out. <laughs> what are you doing? I, I'm, I'm thrashing around under the water. Show, show me what you're doing. I'm trying to find the door. I, I can't find the door. And then I find a hole with, with jagged metal. The very release of the emotion in itself will help him. Coupled with that, um, I gave him suggestions so that his concentration, his thinking, his memory, his self-confidence and his ability to uh, regain control of his life, including overcoming alcohol and uh, being able to cope well, would all improve. I can hear nothing. Right, you can't hear anything. I, I, I'm, can you see anything? I can't see anything either. Right. And all of a sudden I'm in a, in a passageway right. and I can see starlight above me. You've been through the hole with the jagged metal. I imagine I got through the hole with the jagged metal. You can see starlight above. Because I have... Uh, they need to have supportive counselling to help them uh, wind down from these traumas and to make sure that the people do recover. It certainly shouldn't take 28 years. I'm underwater again, I can't breathe. And then all of a sudden, I'm out and I'm on the side of the Melbourne. What's happening? It's, it's brushing against me. Where are you? In the water. Yeah, in the water, it's brushing against it's you. It's brushing against me, and I thought if there was barnacles... Maybe if we had somebody else at the helm at that time who could have said, OK, it was our fault, we accept liability, let's help the people, and I don't mean money-wise now, I mean give them the help they needed at that time, so we wouldn't have... Some committed suicide, others like me ended up as drinkers. If they'd have felt this at the right time, they could have saved a whole ship.